Good evening, church. Good to see you tonight. You have a good afternoon. Good nap. All right. Very good. How is your reading of the apocalypse, the book of Revelation coming? Not so well? Last week was a holiday week kind of busy, distractions, other things uh, going on. We're looking uh, at the seven letters in John's Apocalypse. Uh, usually when people think about the book of Revelation, the seven letters to the seven churches are probably not one of the first things that spring to mind because we think of the book of Revelation as a prophecy that unveils details about the second coming of Jesus Christ. But I gave you a couple of weeks ago a basic outline of the book to try to uh, think about it in total and keep yourself in context as you read it. Uh, the book really falls into um, kind of a logical sequence if you allow it to stay the way that it's presented. There's an introduction in chapter 1. These seven letters in chapters 2 and 3, letters to the churches, uh, and it, they represent... Christ's people, God's people on earth, struggling with all those issues that we struggle with as believers. And then in chapters 4 and 5, which I'm anxious to get to and spend time with you in, we have a picture of God in heaven, the throne, God on his throne. Uh, so there's this contrast of the church on earth, God in heaven, and then we have a sequence for the rest of the book with sevens in it. The first seven is seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, and then a catastrophic event, which is Christ coming in victor victory, the, uh, the uh, great uh, white throne judgment, the uh, millennial kingdom, all of that in, in there. And then we end the book, chapters uh, 21 and 22, with a description of the new heaven and the new earth, or what we would just call heaven. Uh, but it's a new heaven and a new earth, new Jerusalem, in all of that so the grand sweep of the book is that God's people are on earth at the beginning and God's people are, are in heaven at the end and all of this tribulation takes place in, in between uh, so that kind of gives us a place a way to think about the big picture of the book these seven letters are unusual they were probably written at the end of the first century which means that all of the other letters that we're used to reading in the New Testament, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, so forth, were written before these seven letters. So they may actually be telling us something about those other letters which were written earlier. But we've talked a couple of times about the distinctiveness of these particular letters. Let me ask you what you remember. What, is, what distinguishes these seven letters? That, that is, and I, I'm impressed that you remember that. They are written in singular. Most of the letters in the New Testament are written in the plural. It's written to the group. Uh, but these letters are written to the angel of the church in Ephesus, the angel of the church in Smyrna and so forth, and they're addressed in the singular. Our language confuses that, but in Greek you can tell right away whether you're talking to an individual uh, or to a group. And all of these letters are written to that individual. And we discussed who that might be. It's not absolutely clear uh, who it is, but that's who it's written to. What else distinguishes these letters? They all have three sections, which are the introduction, the conclusion and whatever else goes between those two, right? Yeah. Introduction, body, and conclusion. And the introduction in every letter refers to what? It refers to Jesus and it refers to the description of Christ in the first chapter where John sees the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. The end or conclusion of each letter refers to what? Some description from chapters 21 and 22 uh, of heaven. And so right away, each one of these letters, each little letter on its own knits the whole book together because each letter starts out with something in chapter 1 and ends with something in chapter 21 or 22. 
Uh, and, and so there's that, there's that pattern that's laid out in every one of those letters. What, were, what are the, some of the things that we've talked about that distinguish the bodies of these letters? There's, there is a criticism in six of the seven churches. What else? There's a promise, uh, always a promise. Yeah, absolutely. Is that, what did you say before that? There is instruction and there's a promise, absolutely. You know, uh, the, uh, they, are, they are prophetic in nature, the letters are, and prophecy in the Old Testament usually has a, uh, a, a predictable pattern to it. The prophet would come out sometimes just breathing fire, talking about how terrible everything was, but they would never just stop there. They would always say, now here's what you need to do about it, and if you do, this is what God's going to do to bless you. Uh, and these letters demonstrate that as well. What else? What else distinguishes these letters? Absolutely, and isn't that fascinating? There is no indication in all of the textual evidence that we have of the New Testament, which is multitudinous, there are at least 5,000 manuscripts of the Old Testament in Greek, and then tens of thousands of manuscripts in other languages. So the, the evidence for the New Testament is overwhelming, to say the least. And there is no evidence ever, uh, anywhere that we know of, that these letters ever circulated as individual letters. They, once they were written, they were in the larger uh, literary work of uh, John's Apocalypse, and once it got sent to Ephesus, Ephesus was able to see and read what, what Jesus said to Smyrna and what Jesus said to Philadelphia and Laodicea, and Laodicea was able to see what Jesus said to Ephesus and all these others. Now, why is that important? It holds the churches accountable, absolutely, and it, it, uh, it demonstrates that Jesus sees his churches as connected. Jesus sees his churches as connected. Now, I'll say something that may um, uh, be politically incorrect in our, in our country today, in the state of the church in the United States, and may even insult some people, but I'll just tell you what I think about it. Uh, it bothers me that so many churches uh, are independent. I, I, my uh, mentor pastor years ago we would have these arguments about, uh, they would go just like this. He would say, I don't think we're Baptists. And I would say, then what are we? Uh, and he would say, I don't know, but we're not Baptists. Maybe we should just be independent. And I, I would say, do we think we're so right and everybody else is so wrong that there's nobody we can affiliate with or associate with? And then that's where our conversation would end. And eventually he asked me to leave. Okay, so that's how that turned out. Uh, but, but I still feel that way today that um, sometimes it is frustrating and aggravating to try to figure out the right group to, uh, to work with. For us, that's a, it's a fait accompli. We're Southern Baptists, so we work with 45,000 other, ch other churches uh, that are also SBC. But there are a lot of churches today who uh, are kind of cutting their own row. And in the New Testament, there's, there's a connectivity in Jesus' mind. Uh, to, his, to his churches. How that works out organizationally can be done in different ways, but there's got to be some kind of uh, accountability on the church level. Very good. Thank you, Tyler. What else distinguishes these letters? There's a commendation in all but one letter. There's a criticism in all but one letter, and there's a commendation in all but one letter, they're, and they're not the same one. Okay, what else? We've already looked at the letter to Ephesus, uh, and each of these letters kind of leaves an impression on me. There's sort of one thing that I, I kind of remember from each one. There's obviously more than one thing in each letter. But the one thing that sticks in my mind from Ephesus may be different from you. What, what sticks in your mind from Ephesus? Thank you. That's exactly what sticks in my mind. They had lost their first love. And we talked about that. The text does not tell us what that first love is. It either assumes that we know or it leaves it purposefully vague so that we could maybe apply it in, in a variety of ways. 
I've always felt that it just means that first passion that you have when you first get saved. Uh, and it is easy to lose that. Uh, to lose it, get it back, lose it, get it back. That's just sort of how, how we, we go through dry periods you know, in our faith. And he was uh, exhorting them uh, not to just be satisfied with losing that passion, that fire, to regain it. And he uh, uh, encourages them to do so. So that always sticks in my mind about the church in Ephesus, that they lost their first love and they're exhorted to get it back. Now we started looking at the uh, church in Smyrna. By the way, here's another thing too. The, the fact that these letters are knit together in this larger literary structure is a reminder that the New Testament letters, Galatians, Ephesians, and so forth, are also knit together in the larger literary structure of the New Testament, and even more so of the Bible itself, Old Testament and New Testament. And so think back to uh, if we were living in the 50s and 60s, not the 1950s and 60s, but the 50s and 60s, you know, 2,000 years ago, and we were in a church and we got a letter from Paul written to us, say we're in Philippi, and we get a letter from Paul, then um, what, would, what would inspire us to think that we need to hire somebody or task somebody to sit down and write that letter out by hand, no small task. They didn't have a photocopier, so they had to go in and somebody had to scratch that thing out on papyrus uh, and send it off to uh, Ephesus and to Galatia and to Corinth what would inspire us to think that? Why would that even enter our mind? The, the, he wrote us a letter. It's our letter. Why would, we, why would we do anything different with it? Okay, the wisdom and knowledge of it is too good to keep. I have to share it with our brothers and sisters. So you're saying, Chris, that it would just be self-evident that we can't keep this for ourselves. Okay. Somebody else? Have you ever asked that question? How did they know to do that? Why did they do that? Why would, why would you take a letter written to you and suddenly decide that you need to make copies of it and send it around to everyone else? <laughs> yeah. Especially when it's so incriminating to you, uh, Mike says. Like the, the, the letter to the, the Corinthians, I'm sure they weren't thrilled about passing that around, you know, uh, and airing their dirty laundry. Why would they? Jack? There, there's at least one place where Paul asked that that be done. Uh, and, and so he may, have, he may have told them without actually putting it in the letters that they needed to do that. Or there's another possibility. Maybe the Holy Spirit told those churches that they needed to pass those letters around. You think that's a possibility? It's his church, you know. Uh, in fact, in these letters, have you noticed at the beginning it says Jesus is the one speaking, and at the end it says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I is the writer confused? Um, is he not sure whether it's Jesus speaking or the Holy Spirit speaking? Well, actually it's both, because when Jesus speaks, the Holy Spirit speaks, and when the Holy Spirit speaks, Jesus speaks. And when Jesus speaks and the Holy Spirit speaks, God speaks, right? Uh, so it may be that they were, they were uh, maybe that Paul gave them the instruction, or it could just be that the Holy Spirit impressed it upon them that these documents are not just for us, they're for the church. We have this sense of connectivity with the larger work that God is doing. Yes, Jack? Certainly, yeah, when John, but... Um, with, with, with this book, definitely. But they wouldn't have, I don't think that they would have thought that of Paul writing in the 50s, maybe, you know, because there was no reason to think that Paul wouldn't be around for de decades. Uh, he wasn't, but they didn't know that, because uh, in the 60s he was, he was executed. John's thinking about something. Right. 
Absolutely. You know, the belly eats turkey and the brain goes to sleep. You know, uh, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, all, it's all connected. Um, and we should have that sense of connectivity. And sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Jamie? Mm-hmm. Very good. Uh, Jamie points out that the Jews already had a tradition of preserving doctrine that's written down and sharing it with others. But that wouldn't explain why some of the Gentile churches uh, would do that in, in Greece. But I, I would agree with you, absolutely. The Jews would just automatically think to do that. That's part of who they were. Barbara? There's no doubt about that, uh, absolutely. And so when John comes along and he does it, he knits together these seven letters in one literary document and sends it out to the entire church, he is affirming what the church had already started to do earlier in the century by passing the letters around. He's saying, you know that thing where you pass your letters to one another? That's exactly what you should be doing because each letter is written to an individual church but in a broader sense, it's, ri it's written to the church, big C, if you will, uh, because there are authoritative documents that have come from the Holy Spirit through the, uh, the individual writers, and so uh, they are authoritative for the whole church. You know, the, the, the letter to Ephesus is not just authoritative for the church in Ephesus. It's authoritative for all, uh, all churches at all times. Otherwise, why would we be reading it? Because we could say, well, why are we reading a document that's almost 2,000 years old? What, what does it have to say to us? And the answer is everything, everything. Uh, that, that's just the nature of the way God communicates. So again, uh, John is, is saying something to us in these letters, not just in the content, but in the form as well. He's making very important statements to us. If we just, each letter says, the one who has an ear to hear better listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And he's saying even more to us than what meets the eye sometimes uh, in the actual content of the letters. Now, we started reading the letter to Smyrna. Smyrna is the only church, it's the second of the seven letters, the only church that does not get uh, criticized uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And it, the, their letter starts in verse 8. Uh, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things he says, the first and the last, who was dead and is alive. I know your tribulation and poverty. Now, remember this word tribulation. It's going to be an important word in the book of Revelation. It's the word flipsis, and it means to squeeze. It's, it's, it's kind of its literal meaning. You know, uh, when you're persecuted, you're, you're getting squeezed, uh, and it, you find out who, who you are. Uh, and so uh, they were going through a, one of those processes of being squeezed uh, and your poverty. He says, but you're rich. And we talked about that last time. Uh, in the uh, first century, these churches were in a situation, many of them, where they had to choose sometimes between economic stability uh, and their jobs and, and those kinds of things or Jesus uh, because they had these, these local guilds that worshipped at the, uh, the temples. And if you didn't show up for worship at the temple, uh, then they may not call you to come out and fix their plumbing or whatever. You know, you're, you're just, you're out of the circle at that point. Uh, we don't know what's happened to Maurice, but he's not down here worshiping anymore. He, uh, we can't get him to say Caesar is Lord. Uh, he's not using the temple prostitutes anymore. Susan says, woohoo, yeah, you know. Uh, and, and the guy's just, he's off the rails, so uh, we're not sending any work his way. So uh, they had to make these decisions. And uh, this church in Smyrna was apparently in a situation like that, and he's saying, you think you're poor, but you're rich. You're, you're paying a price economically, but the price that you're paying economically is gaining for you great spiritual uh, maturity and, and blessing. Uh, and so he affirms them for the decision that they're making. He says, and he, uh, he knows the blasphemy, back to verse 9, the blasphemy from those calling themselves Jews but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, this is where we stopped last week, and I asked you to go away and think about this. Who, who are these Jews that he's talking about? 
Uh, remember, there's a lot of figurative language in the book of Revelation, so we can always stop and ask ourselves, is this a, should we take this literally? Should we take it figuratively? If we should take it figuratively, what does the figure of speech mean? Uh, anybody want to jump out there and go on the record and give us a, po a possibility? Who are these J people who call themselves Jews but are a synagogue of Satan? Who do you think he's referring to? What's that, John? Okay, they have something to do with this persecution. Absolutely. Carl? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's possible that he's talking about people in here who are Jewish only, in name only, but not in reality. It can, is there any other place in the New Testament that might support that kind of interpretation? Answer is yes, there are. Uh, you may not know where they are, but they're in there. Um, now, how we interpret this may have bearings on uh, how we look at the rest of the letter, because when we come to chapter 7, there's this 144,000. Who's heard of the 144,000? That's usually one of the big things that people talk about in the book of Revelation, the 144,000. Uh, and there's, there's another group around that uh, really makes a big deal out of the uh, 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. That, uh, that's another story. So uh, the, they are from, it's 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, of Israel, and essentially that's been, that's been understood in a couple of different ways as people have read the book of Revelation. One, literally. They're literally people who have the blood of those, those tribes. Somehow or another, God miraculously scoops up 12,000 uh, people that were actually from the tribe of Dan uh, and from the tribe of Gad. And, and here they, they surface uh, at, the, at the end during the tribulation. Uh, and the language certainly would support that. You know, that's, that's what it sounds like. Then others would say, no, it's figurative. You know, 144,000 is, uh, is it's a round number. It's, it's 12 by 12. It's, it's in the book of Revelation, it's full of these numbers with, with uh, figurative meaning to them. Uh, and so maybe since it's a number that can be cubed, it's a number of perfection. And since it's the Jews and the Jews are God's people, then maybe what he really means here is that this is just the church, the totality of the church. The number is really not important. It may have been fewer or more than 144,000, uh, but it's just the church figuratively. Now, we can't, uh, I'm not going to step on a person's hand for doing it, saying that because there's so much figurative language in the book of Revelation. But I think in this particular instance, we're going out of our way uh, to look for figurative, um, a figurative way of taking it. It, is it possible? Can God find uh, 12,000 people who have the blood of Dan in them and 12,000 people who have the blood of Gad in them? Others, some people might say, ah, that's, that just sounds crazy but, or impossible, but God does the impossible. And here's the rub in coming to the book of Revelation. This is where people start arguing about it, you know, because one way doesn't make sense to one and the other way doesn't make sense to another. But when we start talking about the Jews and how they were represented in the book of Revelation, it, it comes up early. It comes way up way back here in chapter 2. How do we take this? What does this mean? Probably what this means is actual Jews who had a synagogue in Smyrna, but they had rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ and so they were jealous of the Christians in town, and they brought some kind of persecution to bear against the Christians in town. Now, the text doesn't absolutely support me in that, it, although you can say that very easily from what's in the text, but I can go back earlier in the New Testament and show, show myself and you many, many cases where that's exactly what happened in city after city after city where Paul rolled in and he began to preach the gospel because Paul, when he came into a new city to preach the gospel, always went where first? If the city had a synagogue, he started at the synagogue. Now, there are practical reasons for that and there are theological reasons for that. The practical reasons would be what? 
where the religious crowd's at? It's, that's a theological reason, yeah. The practical reason would be, uh, well, here's folks who have already read the Bible, supposedly. Uh, they already know about the promises of the Messiah. So I'm already way down the road with him. I can just come in and tell him, hey, the Messiah showed up. He's Jesus. Let's talk. Uh, the theological reason would be that the gospel is for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. And so that both come together there, both the practical and the theological. There were places uh, like Philippi where there was no synagogue and so he looked for a place of prayer all he was always looking for the low-hanging fruit not that he didn't want to do the difficult job uh, but he wanted to get a, a, a foot in the door uh, before he broke out into the rest of the uh, rest of the city but typically what would happen is he would come into town he would begin to preach in the synagogue people would be oh you got to come here this Paul it's amazing uh, he says the Messiah showed up and it's Jesus of Nazareth and, and big crowds would show up and, and some people would say this is great you know what do we need to do and others would say, uh, he's crazy, kind of like the Pharisees did with Jesus that we talked about this morning. Uh, and, and the same kind of thing would happen where they would begin to plot against Paul. And, and eventually they, Paul would get kicked out of the synagogue uh, and all the people who wanted to follow Jesus would go with him. So they'd find another place in town uh, and they'd set up shop and they would uh, start a church and uh, start ministering and reaching out to the rest of the town and the gospel would just explode. People would be interested in it. The Jews would get jealous uh, and Paul would end up in jail or beaten or cat thrown out of town or something like that. And, and this just happens over and over and over again. And so with that scenario, fa just staring us right in the face in the, in the New Testament, when we read these words in Smyrna, it may, uh, uh, in the letter to Smyrna, it makes, absolute, it makes perfect sense to say probably something like that uh, is happening. These are Jews who rejected Jesus. But what's the really stunning language that Jesus uses here? A synagogue of Satan. Wow. That sounds intolerant. Doesn't it? I mean, Jesus, you know, you've got your religious ideas. They've got their religious ideas. Can't you be nice? Can't you just get along? Uh... But why, why, does, why does Jesus use such harsh, sharp, poignant language? Absolutely, because what he is saying is so important. It has eternal consequences. The world who is, the world on, its, on the broad uh, um, boulevard to destruction is always going to be bothered by us if we're passionate about what we say but shouldn't we be because what we're talking we're talking about uh, eternal realities we're talking about heaven and hell we're talking about things that matter more than anything else that's going on uh, in the city or on the globe tonight Jack Absolutely. So it, it is reflected in Jesus' ministry when there are people who purport to be leaders and they lead people astray, that upsets him. Uh, and he uses some rather harsh uh, language here, calls them a synagogue uh, of Satan. Is Jesus an anti-Semite? He's Jewish himself. Thank you, Jack. Very good. All right. Don't forget that, though. Um, all right, so verse 10, he goes on, don't be afraid, don't fear what you are about to, what? Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that, and here a very unusual thing happens right here for just a few words. He switches to plural. He's going along addressing the individual in the singular. And just for just a few words here, let me read it to you and you follow along in your English. Here's what he says, verse 10. Don't fear what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison so that you all will be tested and you all... Y'all, you know Jesus from the south, right? Y'all 
will have flipsis tribulation for 10 days. And then he switches back to the singular. Just right there, just talks to the group for a minute, and he goes back to talking to the angel of the church in Smyrna. He's talking to the angel of the church in Smyrna, blah, 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 boom, talks to the group for a second, pulls back, and continues to talk to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Why does he do that? Why would he do that? <clears throat> Only some of them are going to go to prison. And uh, he... Is he talking to those who are going to prison here when he switches to plural? Or is he talking to those who are not going to go to prison? It, it, you could make the case for either one. But they're a group, aren't they? It is. You know, if, um, if, I, if I were told tomorrow morning that for some strange reason persecution broke out in Camden last night and Marilyn and Sue are, is, are in prison. Sorry, I just you were the first ones I looked at. I would be very anxious about that. Would you? And I'm hoping, be nice, that if I were the one thrown into prison that they would be very anxious about that. I'm hoping, you know. Uh, and, and so he he's kind of switches to the plural here and he says, you know, uh, this is going to be a test for all of you. Some of you are going to go to prison, but it's going to test all of you. And you're going to have some tribulation for 10 days. Uh, be faithful to death, he goes on and says, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, wait a minute. Let's back up just a minute. If Jesus knows that the devil is going to throw some of them in prison and give them persecution, tribulation, and that some of them might die, isn't there another way we can deal with this? If Jesus already knows that that's what's going to happen, what's another way that maybe we could handle this situation? <laughs> I'm going to remember you said that, Jack. Jack said, leave town. This is a Gethsemane moment. Absolutely, because Jesus is coming and he's saying, it's fixing to get tough. Some of you may die. Now, I want you to I want to put, put yourself in their shoes for just a moment and imagine that that just happened here, and you have no reason to doubt it. You have no reason to doubt that Jesus himself has just told us that some of us are going to die. How would you really respond to that? What's that, Kathleen? Yeah, I know, but that's academic. You know, it's, that happens to somebody else. Just like for us, you know, the, yeah, those, those poor Christians in Egypt got their heads cut off, uh, but I'm going to go home and watch Netflix tonight. But all of a sudden, if my head's getting cut off, things are completely different right so wh what would what would our thought process be if suddenly i'm the one that's got the orange jumpsuit on and my head's being cut off now what am i thinking okay no, i appreciate that jane i hope we would all want to be faithful absolutely um but there, the, the, there's one logical question that we could ask, and I think if we really were in that situation, we would ask it. And it would be this. Okay, God, so you know that the devil's fixing to come against us. Why don't you just wipe him out? Just stop it. You, if you know it's going to happen, if you know it's going to happen, what you're telling me is you're going to let it happen. So why are you going to let it happen? That may not occur to us now because it's not real, real, but when it's real, it does. The reason I know that is from pastoral ministry. You see people sit in the pew and sing their songs, and they're great until suddenly they're the ones who are told they have cancer. Well, they've prayed for everybody else in the church when they had cancer, but when they get cancer, I'll tell you, it's a different deal. 
It's a whole different deal. Then we start asking the real questions. Wait a minute. Uh, why did God let that happen to me? Well, you didn't ask that when it happened to so-and-so. Yeah, I know, but this is me. Uh, and, and I don't know what the, the Smyrnees uh, asked, or the Smyrnonians, or whatever they're called. But, but God is telling them, I'm going to let this happen. And I want you to be faithful, even if it means you give up your life. Would God do that to the church in America? Uh, are we special? Do we have some kind of special protection, some bubble around the United States? Hadn't seen it yet. Verse 11, uh, notice he says, I will give him the crown of life if you die. Notice the irony in that? If you die, I will give you the crown of life. A lot of times we treat this life as if, as if it is the crown. But the crown is the life that he gives us later on, even if it means that we seal our testimony uh, with our blood. And then verse 11, the one who has ears, let him listen to what the Spirit says. Or remember that that construction is, really sounds too weak. It should be more like this. The one who has ears, listen. Listen to what the Spirit says uh, to the church to the church is, excuse me, the one who overcomes will certainly not be harmed. It's a double negative, which is grammatically proper in Greek, and that's how they uh, emphasize. There's two negative particles. There's ou and there's me. So when you say no, you can say ou or you can say me. And if you really want to say no, you say ou me. All right? This is an ou me. The one who overcomes will certainly not, certainly not be harmed by the second death. So it was all life and death issues with Smyrna. Life and death issues. And at the beginning of the letter, notice he said, I'm the one who was dead and I'm alive, so you can listen to me because I know that you're facing death. But remember, I've already been there. And I know that there's life on the other side because I bought it for you. All right, um, let's prepare our hearts for the Lord's table, gentlemen, who are going to serve. The one who was dead, and he is alive. We want to remember his death and his resurrection as we come to the table tonight. He is the one who sealed his testimony with his blood. He did go to Gethsemane. He agonized. He asked God those questions that we ask inevitably when we see a rough patch of road coming. God, do we really have to go down this part of the road? Can't we find a smoother way? Jesus, in his humanity, asked the same questions that we ask. And so we can relate to him. He relates to us. We have a high priest who sympathizes with us, who understands exactly what we're going through. Uh, and he says, I've been there already. You can trust me. You can follow me. I am the one who was dead, and I am alive. And if you die for me, then I will give you the crown of life. Now, we remember that death uh, in, in the ceremony, the ritual that he has given us called uh, the Lord's Supper. And let's just take a moment uh, and bow our heads and prepare our hearts and our spirits before we get the bread. There are two criteria biblically for taking the Lord's Supper. And the first one is that we be saved. Um, it's not about any particular local church membership. It's about membership in the body of Christ. And so for those who are here tonight who are not um, members of Grace Baptist Church, and there are several of you here tonight, uh, it's not about whether or not that you have uh, formally joined the church or put your name on the roll here at Grace Baptist Church. But the Bible tells us that there's a book of life and that there are names in the book of life. And the important thing there is whether or not we have professed faith in Jesus Christ. And so I would just ask you tonight, have you uh, done two things? Number one, have you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins based on his, uh, his blood shed at the cross at Calvary? But that's only half of it. That's, that's not enough. That's the first step. The second step is have you confessed Jesus as your Lord? You see, Jesus is both Savior and Lord, and he's not Savior until he is Lord. He's not Lord until he's Savior. 
they come together. He was delivered over to sin for our death and raised, for, uh, and raised to life for our justification. Uh, and so his death brings us forgiveness. His life brings us lordship. It brings us a new power that we can walk in. If you've never done that, if you're here tonight and you've never done that, God is stirring your heart and you're, you're thinking, I need to do that, then why don't we just stop and do it right now? You just say a simple prayer in your heart, God will hear it, and take those two steps. The first one would be to say this, God, I know that I need to be forgiven. I've disobeyed you. And I know that you sent Jesus to die so that I can be forgiven. And I'm asking you now, based on his death, please forgive me of all my sin. Now, when you say that prayer, the Bible promises that all your sin, past, present, and future, is wiped out. It's a great promise, but that's only half of it. Here's the other half. The other half is to say, God, I confess Jesus to be my Lord. I want your presence in my life, guiding me, being my master, and giving me a new direction in life. Now, if you've just said that prayer for the very first time, I invite you to join us here in a moment and take the bread and the cup. But I also uh, want to urge you to tell me or someone you trust, I said a prayer to get saved for the very first time. What do I need to do next? And let's talk about what the next step of faith is. So that's the first criteria is being saved. Here's the second one. It's simple. It's in 1 Corinthians. We come to the table and take it absolutely seriously. Uh, this is no trivial thing that we do. This is, this is an important part of worship as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and so we take it very seriously, even though it is, it is a ritual, but it, it is a ritual that was instituted by the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's important. There are spiritual realities connected to this ritual that bring meaning, rich meaning to it. And so I, I would just ask you to take a moment and pray this prayer. Oh, Lord, would you search my heart? And see if there's any way in me that needs to be corrected. Is there anything in me that needs to be corrected? Let's just take a, a, a moment or two of silence and you listen, for, you listen for the Spirit in your heart. Father in heaven, we thank you tonight for the sacrifice that Jesus made so that we can be forgiven and know that we're right with you, know that in your eyes we have clean hands and a pure heart. We thank you, Father, that that opens the door of our life for the presence of your Holy Spirit to empower us, to sanctify us, to enable us to mature in our spiritual walk with you. We thank you, Father, that we can continue on a daily basis, if necessary, to ask for your forgiveness and that you promised to cleanse us from all of our sin. God, we pray that we would always have that humble, contrite spirit before you to quickly reconcile with you whenever there is sin in our life. But we also pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would uh, enable us to mature in our walk with you and not just get stuck in a cycle of sinning and asking for forgiveness over and over again and never growing. Lord, let us remember all of this that Christ has made available as we take this bread and this cup. In Jesus' name, amen. Gentlemen.